to you by saying how excited we are that you're going to be able to show this film as part of Unknown Pleasures. And I was wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about Senses of Cinema and why you've decided to show that film as part of Unknown Pleasures. Yeah, so um, Senses of Cinema is a really significant uh, Australian documentary about the history of the Australian film co-ops from the 70s through to the pres- uh, the sort of mid-90s when they kind of folded. Um, it's a bit of a little-known period in Australian film history, but it's an increasingly and, and um, an increasingly significant one in particular uh, in the way that it follows the um, thread of the rise of feminist filmmaking, workers' activist filmmaking, Indigenous filmmaking, queer filmmaking. All of these movements were running concurrently with the... Um, this sort of uh, the progressive leftist agenda of the 60s and 70s. And so you'd have all these micro communities form and they formed really predominantly in Sydney and Melbourne, although some also formed in Adelaide a little bit later. Um, they formed initially around um, workers' rights and, and women's rights and, and slowly grew to encompass land rights, uh, LGBTQIA plus activism and things like that. Um, and so what Census does is it sort of offers a snapshot of that particular period of time and tries to contextualise it um, with the um, present time um, as to and looking at why those things are important. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of these filmmakers embody also is a very independent spirit. Um, a lot of the films that were made during the, that time um, sort of existed outside of any institutional system. And in fact, these filmmakers, people like Julian Lay and um, Margot Nash and Jenny Thornley um, and Martha Ansara in Sydney, and in Melbourne you had people like Ivan Gold and you had uh, John Hughes, who's the director of Senses of Cinema, the documentary now, but he was also part of those movements in the 70s. Um, you know, a whole spread of different filmmakers making really vital, vibrant and interesting films um, and oftentimes very personal films. So they wouldn't just be activist films, they'd be essay films, that they'd, they'd be documentaries, they'd be independent uh, narrative fiction films, but they'd usually have um, something quite uh, formally daring or innovative uh, behind them. Um, and a lot of these films were not institutionally supported initially, but um, the Australian Film Commission did did start an experimental film fund that helped pretty much from the 80s period onward start to, to kind of support the cops and support their, the filmmakers making films as part of the cops. Um, but this sat uh, very much adjunct to the mainstream Australian film industry, uh, film industry at the time that was sort of spurred by the 70s film revival. What were some of the more important films that came out of those film co-ops at that time, do you think? Um, there's a, there's a, a significant number of them, probably too many to mention. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the most significant is My Survival as an Aborigine. Yeah. Um, and that's a film that was co-directed by Martha Ansara and Essie Coffey, the um, Indigenous actress and, and um, an activist who sadly passed away now. Um, but there were sort of really key cornerstone films of each of those movements at the time, so that was one of them. Um, you had people like Alessandro uh, Cavadini, who was sort of circling around the community at the time, and so his film Ninglana, which has also um, just recently been restored, uh, you could say it was sort of part of that movement, albeit it was, wasn't really made in the context of a co-op, but it was also another significant film of that period. And uh, that's obviously the, the, that incredible uh, documentary about the Aboriginal tent embassy in Canberra. Um, there were films like um, We Ain't to Please by Margot Nash and Robin Laurie, uh, a film called Landslides um, by um, uh, Susan Lambert. Um, many, many, many significant films. Um, and, and a good number of them are profiled in, in the documentary Senses of Cinema. Definitely. What were your first thoughts when you sat down to watch Senses of Cinema? I mean, obviously, it's a film that you thought was important enough to have shown as part of Unknown Pleasures, but what were your thoughts when you first sat down to watch Senses of Cinema? Well, for me, it was like, well, finally, there's a film that profiles this period, because I've known John Hughes, uh, who's together with Tom Zabricki, the co-director of Senses of Cinema, um, for quite a while, and, and we talked quite frequently about how his project was coming along, because originally it started as a um, you know, a significant uh, research project. He spent many, many years researching the cops and writing articles about the cops, several of which um, were published in the journal Senses of Cinema, um, which is, is where the film takes its name from. 
Um, and I, I suppose the, the great um, reaction I had to the film was one of a uh, sense of seeing the films um, not canonized per se, but but given a, a, a contemporary context that they hadn't had before, yeah. and being put in dialogue with one another. Because the film really is, yes, it's a terrific documentary, but it's also, in some ways, the first major, um, I suppose, uh, outcome of a research project solely dedicated to the cop. So. Um, there's a lot of uh, research and thought behind the film, and it's it's quite, in some ways, it's quite comprehensive. Certainly, in relation to the movements happening in Sydney um, at the time, which which I think is another thread of Australian film history that's that's sadly undervalued or has been undervalued up until the present. Definitely. Now, of course, at Unknown Pleasures, you quite often have Q and As, and this time the Q and A is with John Hughes and Ivan Gall. Tell us a little That's bit. Right, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, and and how the audience will be able to interact with them after the screening as well. Yeah, so this is going to be quite a cool screening. I mean, the Thornbury Picture House is a fairly small theatre; it's like a fifty seater. Uh, but we anticipate a lot of the audience members will also be filmmakers, people that either know John, know the film, or have have perhaps even part, been part of the comp in Melbourne at some point. Um, so I'm sort of anticipating the the, the um, reaction to the film to be quite. Uh, active, uh, a lot of discussion in the audience. I mean, oftentimes we'll have filmmakers present like Nigel Bust or critics and, and actors like John Flaus. He's a regular attendee to our um, screenings. And so there's there's oftentimes a lot of cross-talk uh, through our Q&As, more like an open forum than a traditional Q&A. Uh, but I just love, I love doing them. I mean, it's just great to be able to sit with the filmmakers and and chat about their work and, and give it give it a local context. It's It's always really exciting. Yeah. Now, our listeners are generally cinema fans. If one of our um, listeners headed along to check out the film, what would you hope that they took away from this film? Um, just a greater curiosity about um, other facets of Australian film history and a desire to want to engage with these films and these filmmakers. You know, I would hope that, that people would engage with the filmmakers at the screening, whether that be John or Ivan or whoever else ends up turning up on the night. Um, it's a great way uh, for people that ha- have an interest in Australian cinema to start building those direct and active engagements uh, with other practitioners. That's one of the primary reasons we've launched Unknown Pleasures, which is to really to spotlight uh, underseen or undervalued Australian films, some of which may have, have, have been um, you know, relatively successful in their time, but which have lapsed into a kind of semi-obscurity now because of the ways in which the Australian film repertory um, uh, lack of Australian film repertory programming, I would say, overall across the country has, has led to this kind of issue. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the, the real primary reason we've launched it is we want to encourage more people to come along and start to kind of ingest a real sense of Australian film history into their bones so that when they go out into the industry as practitioners themselves, and we have a lot of young, young filmmakers that come along, uh, they, they step into that space with a certain kind of knowledge or authority or interest. Um, I think it's a, a widespread failure of the film schools, both both here and, and interstate, that they don't foster that kind of specific local knowledge about our own Australian screen culture outside the usual suspects like Priscilla or Madman or the, the sort of the canonised top 100 Time Out Australia uh, feature films. I mean, which are you know, they're necessary. It's very important to, to study and look at those films, but that's not the sum totality of our, of our film culture. We've had a very, very, very rich history over many, many, many decades. And um, it's kind of shocking, shocking to us. And by us, I say myself and, and my co-curator, Bill Mazoulis, is also a um, wonderful uh, Australian independent filmmaker who's had a 35, 40 year career. Um, yep. It's shocking to us that this work isn't done more frequently. Uh, I'm, I'm the same. It's, it shocks me quite often when I talk to people that um, that went through the same film school as me because I think stuff may have changed since I went there. Because, Where did you go? Um, so I went through VCA. Um, as uh, cool. Yeah. yeah. But there's a few people out there that I know that have been through different film schools that I've spoken to over the years and they have no idea about some of the even exploitation films. I don't even know what the word exploitation means, which to me yeah, is crazy. is it's crazy. really really surprising. So, well, here's an interesting uh, here's an interesting point of connection with that. So, one of my good friends is Peter Tammer. Now, Peter Tammer was head of the VCA in the eighties, right? Yep. And one of his his students was Glendon Ivan, 
Yep. And if you go to the YouTube VCA 50 Years 50 Films page, you'll see an interview with Glenn where he talks about what an influence Peter was on him and particularly in, in relation to his, his early documentary practice because, you know, Glendon made a really, really wonderful uh, grad uh, documentary about um, a delivery driver, I believe, a delivery, delivery cyclist that was, I think, overseen by Peter. Um, and, and Glendon's insight into that process and the way he, he was able to transform his, you know, because obviously he's worked very, very successfully in fiction features and in, in long-form television, but having that documentary grounding and having, I think, Peter as a, an early mentor for him was, was something quite significant. Yep. So, and, that's, and, and Peter was in and around the co-op movement. So a lot of that indie spirit, independent film practice, a desire to cultivate uh, a particular methodology that's individual yep. and protecting that individuality, because Peter's always, always done that uh, with his practice, is um, it's just a really good grounding foundation for, for filmmakers. And I think one of the issues that we face now is that, you know, even people in the, in the and I'm not saying this necessarily of, of VCA because I, I don't, um, I haven't been to VCA myself, so I'm not sure what it's like there, but there's certainly a, um, a, 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 there's certainly a lot of difficulties that the film schools have in, in including, more broadly speaking, Australian film studies within their pedagogy. And as a result, we don't quite have the same uh, senior literacy to say that uh, maybe filmmakers like Glendon and, 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 and earlier generations of Australian feature filmmakers and um, TV filmmakers perhaps had. Definitely, yeah. Um, you know, and that, that, that relates to a number of things, and most particularly the, the way in which uh, filmmaking has moved into the kind of moving image content landscape. And so there's a, so much wider, broader variety of, of different kinds of screen media to, to consume and reflect on that the, the notion of the feature film is, uh, is, is shifting. So I can understand that perhaps it's difficult to know where to look when you're a young filmmaker these days as to, you know, what are you actually going to be? I mean, some filmmakers are coming into this space now, you know, with no interest in making feature films, and that's fine. They have an interest in something else. Yep. Yeah, and I think it also depends a lot on who your lecturers are. My major yeah. lecturer was Ray Mooney, who um, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, yep. was very big in showing us a lot of independent Australian cinema, of course, because... His film Every Night, Every Night was part of that movement. And, um, That's right, it was. Yeah, so we, I think after watching films like that, we went out and explored more and more. But uh, yeah, I just find it surprising that when I talk to a lot of the people that have been through the, some of Australia's leading film schools over the last few years, they just have no, absolutely no idea about the history no of idea. Australian yeah. cinema. So it's 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 something that we you know Bill and I are trying to work on more substantially like uh, we, we really are trying to expand uh, the boundaries of what we're doing as well over I mean we've been doing this for the last couple of years but it's definitely something that we want to continue yeah. because it's an enormous it's an, and it's a gap not just in Melbourne it's a gap nationally so you know the cinematechs will will program Australian feature films and retrospectives of Australian feature films um, and as will the Arc Cinema at the NFSA and other organizations like Cinema Reborn run by Jeff Gardner in Sydney will do it. Um, but there isn't really a concerted effort for repertory across the country in the, in the way that there was when the co-ops were operating because the yeah. co-ops were not just uh, cooperatives, and it's, pr it's probably worth me clarifying what I mean by the word co-op, which stands for cooperative. Uh, a lot of these were basically film collectives set up by filmmakers and other people in the film community to produce and exhibit films. So they would pull resources together and they would work on each other's films, as you would at film school, really. Um, and they would create distribution networks across the country that would allow the films to be screened. So that's, and they'd screen them anywhere. Sometimes they'd screen them in cinemas, sometimes they'd screen them in community halls, but they would have partner co-ops in the, in the other states. And, and the Sydney Melbourne, uh, um, I suppose relationship is a really significant one here, but they would they would set up a they they set up a, a distribution network that would allow their films to travel the country. Um, so it was a pretty integrated model in terms of the way in which they went about doing it, to the point that some of the co-ops ended up getting some early uh, organisational funding, uh, funding from the film agencies to run for a few years, so that they were able to appoint administrators and staff. But eventually, that 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 funding was rescinded. Yeah. As the priorities of Australian culture shifted, I suppose you could, that's a generous way of putting it. But, you know, the, the cultural agenda in Australia over the last 25 years has been resoundingly conservative. 
And, you know, micro arts organizations have been, always been the first to be affected. And as you'd see more broadly with things like the defunding of um, many arts organizations uh, uh, via the Australia Council a few years ago, which scuppered some of the best organizations making the best art in the country, like Liquid Architecture in Melbourne, for instance. So, um, it, it, you know, to, to really engage with this with this period of history, you, you also have to engage with the larger socio-political and cultural shifts around the country at the same time. So, so um, hopefully those coming to see the film are interested not just in filmmaking per se, but also in, in the dynamics of uh, Australian cultural life more broadly over the last 50 years. Definitely. And for so all it's a really this... dynamic, it's, it's a dynamic investigation of this period as much as it is at the films and the filmmakers themselves. It is. And for all our listeners out there, if you are wanting to head along to check out Senses of Cinema, it's screening as part of Unknown Pleasures at the Thornbury Picture House on Tuesday, the February the 7th at 8.30pm. And bookings are absolutely essential. So go to thornburypicturehouse.com.au to grab your tickets. Chris, I'm hoping that we can get you on our show as a regular guest this year because I would love you to come on every time that there's an Unknown Pleasures screening coming on so that you can let our listeners know because that's one of the things that we want to do on this show is tell people about Australian cinema and get them excited about Australian cinema. So hopefully we have you on our show a a lot this year. I really appreciate that, David. And yeah, I'll for sure keep in touch. We've got a pretty regular program of screenings once a month that we're about to announce in the next few weeks. So yeah, it'd be a great opportunity to come on and chat a couple more times.